All right. We are on the Get Foxy show with Dr. Jeffrey Gurian. Jeffrey, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you are a busy guy, but uh, you gave us an opportunity to chat with you today about your book. Thank you so much. Very welcome, Terry. It's great to be on with you. How are things in the country where you are, by the way? How's the weather there today? Uh, overall, uh, you know, we're in Colorado, so we get sunshine a lot. It is uh, about 80 degrees here right now, sunshine, and it's beautiful. So when we get done here, I'm definitely going to be outside. <laughs> we got your beat. I'm in New York City. We, we got about 90 degrees today. It's been that way for a few days, but I don't mind because the winters were so brutal that I, I promised myself I wouldn't complain when it's hot during the summer. However hot it is, that's fine for me. That's excellent. Well, I'm glad to be with you today. Thank you, you bet. Well, Jeffrey, you are a very unique individual. You've got quite an interesting history. You're a dentist, you're a comedian, you're an author. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about your book, Healing Your Heart by Changing Your Mind. So I'd, I'd like to know, a little bit about how you came around to writing this book. Okay, great. And there's more to the title than that. It's called Healing Your Heart by Changing Your Mind, a spiritual and humorous approach to achieving happiness. And I always start out by telling the difference between spirituality and religion, because that's very important, because some people hear the word spirituality and right away they tie it in with religion. And it really has nothing to do with that because religion can be wonderful for people, but it tends to divide us because it puts you into a category and other people are automatically outside of that category if they don't share the same religion. What spirituality does is it brings us all together because all it asks is that you believe in a force greater than yourself. You could call it nature or the universe or God, whatever is comfortable for you, as long as you know that it isn't you that's controlling everything in your life. Because when you go through life thinking that it's up to you to make everything work out perfectly, that's how you wind up with emotional illness. And I've been on the board of this interesting group called the Association for Spirituality and Psychotherapy since 1999. And even though that was not my original training, my original training was as a cosmetic dentist. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was in practice for many years and then I was <clears throat> a clinical professor at New York University in the oral medicine and orofacial pain department. And my specialty was treating headaches and the physical symptoms of stress, most of which affect women, but we'll get into that as we go on. And um, so this book that I wrote, um, it's a compilation of, I'd say at least 15 to 20 years of experience my life experience. And a lot of it is based on my experience as a stutterer. I stuttered very badly into my 20s and beyond, probably even into my 30s. And it was the bane of my existence. It's a very difficult thing if you're a stutterer. People tend to make fun of it in movies and comedians joke about it, but it's really a terrible disability. And uh, I realized one day that I didn't stutter when I was alone, which was a very important thing. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the serenity prayer, but there's a prayer that says, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the most important line is, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's such an important thing, because there are some things, each of us in life has something that we would change about ourselves if we could. But some things you can't change, and that's where acceptance comes in. Um, I always say a man with a limp limps in every room of his house. He can't go into a room by himself and close the door and walk perfectly. And, and walk perfectly. But I realized that I could go into a room by myself and not stutter. I could say every word that was difficult for me. And my name, especially, most stutterers can't say their own names. I couldn't say Gurian for anything. When I went to college, I made myself run for the president of the freshman class. And I went to a very big college that was a feeder school from like seven different high schools. So I knew the kids from my high school, but I didn't know the kids from the other six high schools. And I had to meet them and I couldn't introduce myself because I couldn't speak without stuttering. So I had kids that knew me 
who acted as my campaign manager. And they would take me around and they'd introduce me. They said, this is Jeffrey Gurian is running for president. And the reason I ran for president was because I told myself that if I could win the election, I wouldn't have to stutter anymore. Because I had a feeling it had something to do with how I felt about myself. And you can't win an election if nobody votes for you, right? It's a sign that people like you if they vote for you. No one votes for you just to be polite. They vote for you if they like you. It was a very great lesson for me because I won the election. I was the president of the whole freshman class and I still stuttered. And the lesson was very important because it taught me that outside validation doesn't work in life. It doesn't matter how many people compliment you and tell you you're fantastic and fabulous and talented. It matters what you think of yourself. And so given this knowledge that I didn't stutter when I was alone, I consider it grace. I was given the grace to figure out that there was really nothing wrong with me, that it was in my mind. I had created it for some reason as a child, because most stutterers start stuttering when they're six or seven years old, but you start speaking when you're around two years old. So for four or five years, I spoke fine, and then all of a sudden, something happened. You can't catch stuttering. It's not a disease. It has something to do with my thinking. And I always teach, I, you know, as an avocation, I work with stutterers, and I teach them my technique of how not to stutter. And so my parents had sent me for speech therapy, and no one was able to help me. And I was determined not to go through my whole life as a stutterer. I worked on myself literally for years. I was obsessed with curing myself. And as you see, I no longer stutter, and, but I think about it all the time. Um, I, had to, I had to examine my thoughts, which is a very hard thing to do, to be, to be objective about your thoughts. Each one of us, everybody listening to your show, is carrying thoughts that may not be valid for them. And many, many, many times those thoughts have been given to us by strangers, by people who didn't have our best interests at heart. Sometimes if you were bullied as a child and people said mean things about you, somewhere in your mind you tend to believe what they're saying because you're just a kid. And if more than one person is saying it, you start to doubt yourself. And these negative thoughts, I call them heart wounds. As you grow up, every time someone hurts your feelings or breaks a promise to you or lies to you or hurts you in any way, I feel that we carry them with us in our heart chakra. And I know you're familiar as an acupuncturist. I know that you're familiar with chakras. You bet. And we carry them, and I call them heart wounds. And they affect our self-esteem and our self-confidence, and they affect every decision that we make. Because every time you're called upon in your life to make a decision, you use your thoughts. You think of what you should do. Who else's thoughts can you use? So you, th you try to think your way into what you should do. And if your thoughts aren't valid, your decisions are not going to work for you. And so what I had to do is I had to objectively look at my thoughts, see which thoughts I was holding that were negative about myself, that weren't true. And I had to change my self-image from what must have been an inferiority complex to a superiority complex, not to feel better than other people, but just to feel even. I liken it to a piece of paper. If you, if you fold a piece of paper in half and you want to get the crease out, you have to fold it exactly the opposite way, 180 degrees, so that the paper will be flat again. That's how I look at what I did with my mind. I took what must have been an inferiority complex and turned it into what I would think of as a superiority complex. Again, not to feel better than other people, but just to feel even so I could show up. And I worked on myself for years and until I could free myself from the bondage of stuttering. What this book is about, it's, not, it's certainly not only about stuttering, it's about overcoming obstacles in your life by thinking a different way. One of the main concepts is that you can't change your past. The only thing you could change is your perspective of your past. Many times you'll have two or three children grow up in the same household, same parents, same environment, but they'll think of their childhood in a completely different way. They'll, they'll repeat stories to you about what it was like growing up, and you'd think they wouldn't even grow up in the same household because their interpretation of what happened to them is very different. And that's what happens to us in life. And 
we're very affected by our sensitivity, which is one of the reasons that stress-related illness affects women much more than it affects men. And there's a very good reason for that, and it's almost a sad reason. Women are gifted with a sensitivity that often feels like a burden instead of a strength. And our society doesn't help matters any by telling women very often that they're too sensitive, which is entirely the wrong message because it's a blessing to be sensitive. It makes you more empathetic. And if people in this world were more sensitive, it would be a much kinder world. You know? But when you're given that kind of message, you think that there's something wrong with being sensitive, especially men. Men find it very hard to admit to their sensitivity. I had no choice. I was a very sensitive kid. As a child growing up, I was incredibly sensitive. And in those days, I looked at it as a burden. As I got older, I learned more through my work in spirituality and being in practice and working on patients made me very caring. One of my patients, I'll never forget, he said, I think you'd rather hurt yourself than hurt me. And I said, yeah, that's really, that's really very true because I went out of my way to develop very painless techniques to make people comfortable because so many people are afraid of going to the dentist. And I can so relate to that, Jeffrey. Yeah, and, and, and for most people, it started when they were children. Because a lot of dentists had no business working on children. They didn't have the temperament or the personality to work on children, yet they did it anyway. And they created generations of, of adults who were afraid to go to the dentist. So I, I dedicated myself to, most of my practice was cosmetic in nature, but I dedicated myself to making people comfortable and to putting positive energy out to the world. And that's how I wound up in the comedy world because there's no nicer thing that you could do than make people feel good and make them laugh and make them beautiful. So I combine those two things. There's a famous columnist in New York who said, she figured out the connection between my two worlds that I make people laugh to see if they have any teeth missing. <laughs> So I'm sorry for such a long answer, but when you asked me about that, there's so much to say. So I wrote this book, Healing Your Heart by Changing Your Mind, Letting Go of the Pains that We Carry by Changing the Way You Think. And in doing that, you let go of a lot of stuff that you've been holding on to for your whole life. All the resentments, you know, all, all the resentments that we tend to carry uh, against people that we feel have hurt us in some way. Those things only hurt us, you know? I don't know if you ever heard that statement. Resentment is like you taking poison, expecting the other person to die. Yes. You know, and that's what happens. It eats away at us, all those things, and we wind up hurting ourselves. So this book is so much about thought, about how to change the way you think and how to release these heart wounds so that you can achieve a life of happiness. That's my goal. And if you saw the cover, if I hold it up, it's got a, uh, a meditating dog, right? A dog in lotus position. Did you see that? Yes, I did. See it on your screen? Yeah, a lot of people resonate with it. And, and it recently hit number one on Amazon, a bestseller status in three different categories, medicine and psychology, adult children of alcoholics, and self-help. I've got a lot of great response from people in the recovery field, from people who work with addicts and alcoholics, because there's a, a lot in here that pertains, that pertains to the 12-step programs, because they're spiritual programs and they're very powerful. So let me throw it back to you so you can ask questions, because I don't want to monopolize. <laughs> I can talk, as you can see, and I don't stutter anymore. But you're making, you're making my job easy here, Jeffrey, and I, I so appreciate that. <laughs> I want to hear from you, though. One of the common questions that I ask my guests, because this is the Get Foxy show, is what does being foxy mean to you? That's an interesting question. Being foxy to me means creating your own style, your own persona, being independent not being part of the crowd. You know, my look is my brand. Um, 
I've been working on my brand for many years. So I might not fit into a crowd, but I have my own, look, there's something on the screen. I don't know if you can see it. I'm gonna get rid of it. Um, you have your own look. You have a very unique look, which is great. You develop that. Most people feel like they, like, I don't know, they're followers. They have to, they want to be trendy. They want to look like everybody else looks, whether it looks good on them or not. So I think being foxy is having the courage to be independent and having your own style and going with what you like as opposed to what the crowds of people like with the understanding that not everything is, is meant for everybody. Like I said before, not everybody can grow a good beard. You know? That <laughs> is true. Try, they, and they wind up with this patchy stuff, you know, long hairs with spaces in between, you know, and some guys get beautiful beards. They're nice and even. They have a shape. Other guys get these. I always say there's a big difference between having a beard and having hair on your face. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that is the truth. That is the truth. So and I think the takeaway message from that is uh, don't feel compelled to grow a beard if you don't have the genetics for it. Because trust me, no one's interested in your interpretation of a beard. You know, either you have one or you don't. There you go, ladies. Encourage your husbands to just play to their strengths. Encourage exactly. your boyfriend. If, if he can't grow that beard, go ahead and be okay. He's, he's okay being a clean shaven man exactly he's still <laughs> fine he doesn't feel the need he doesn't have to have that beard in in uh, new york these days i don't know in brooklyn especially the hipster community everyone is riding a unicycle with a long beard it looks like you stepped into the 1800s like in the old west like around civil war days you know oh, very, my goodness. very interesting scenario <laughs> Who embodies Foxy in your world right now, Jeffrey? Who embodies Foxy? You know, it's funny. I have a friend, uh, and we call her Foxy, and she does radio, Carolyn Fox, and she's very well known on radio. And I always refer to her as Foxy. Well, she uses that brand herself. But who's Foxy to me? Uh, I meet people every day that I consider Foxy. As I said, independent thinkers. Uh, I find that very interesting and very fascinating. People who don't fall into the mold, they just, they go out of their way to be interesting. Some people can't help it. They're just interesting. You know, they just, uh, they're not afraid because it takes courage to do that. It's a lot easier to just blend in and be like everybody else. But if you can be foxy and be different and interesting, I think that's a great accomplishment in life. You know, and so that's my answer, and I'm sticking with it. Uh, and it seems to me that with the work that you do with Comedy Matters TV, you tend to see and run into a lot of foxy people. I do. I run into a lot of very famous and very successful people, and I've always been fascinated by that. I just got back from Montreal. Every year at the end of July, they have the Just for Laughs Festival the biggest comedy festival in the world. It actually goes on for a month. The first two weeks are in French, second two weeks in English. And people from the comedy industry come all over, from LA, from Europe, from Australia. They come from all over and everyone gathers in Montreal. And there are the most amazing shows. The most exciting part is the uh, Just for Laughs award ceremony. And I get to cover that every year. They give me special passes. And fortunately, I know most of the stars, so they come over and I do video interviews for my Comedy Matters TV channel on YouTube. And I have everybody on there from Jimmy Fallon, uh, Chelsea Handler, Jim Carrey, uh, Chris Rock, Susie Essman, Lisa Lampanelli, just on and on. And so this year, I got some very exciting interviews. Tiffany Haddish, one for the Comedy Person of the Year. And, you know, she's in the new show with Tracy Morgan called The Last OG. She just had a huge hit in the, the, the movie Girls Trip with Queen Latifah. And she's a huge star right now. She's probably, you know, she and Amy Schumer are probably the, the two biggest female stars right now. So she got Comedy Person of the Year. And I know Tiffany since she started. So 
when she saw me on the red carpet, I got the biggest hug from her and a great, a great interview and how excited she was. Cause I, you know, it's exciting for me watching these people go up so many levels. But when you start out, it's such a difficult field to make a name for yourself in the comedy world. There's so much competition. And so I, I got to speak to her and you know who else was there? Oh, and her award was presented to her by Kevin Hart. And I had the honor of producing an award, uh, not an award, a show, a benefit for Haiti, starring Kevin Hart, featuring Chris Rock's brother, Tony Rock. And 3,000 people showed up. It was a very successful event. Kevin Hart is another superstar. Uh, Howie Mandel was there, who actually bought part of this festival this past year. He's now a partner in the Just for Laughs Festival. And I got an interview with him. I got a very rare interview with Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle never does red carpets. It's so rare. But he was doing a show with John Mayer, you know, the seven-time Grammy Award winner. And they both did the red carpet. And they both came over to talk to me. I know Dave for a while. And so it's a big advantage because there's a lot of competition on a red carpet. And it's very hard to get the people to stop off and talk to you. But luckily, they know me, so they come over to chat. And I got a great interview with Dave and with John Mayer. Mark Marin was there. He's got a new show called Glow, The Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. That's on Netflix, I believe. On Netflix, yep. Yeah, and it's a fun show. And I know Mark from New York for so many years. And who else was there? Joe Coy. Joe Coy is a great comedian. And he got the award for Stand-Up Comedian of the Year. And Lil Rel, Lil Rel Howery was there too. He's got a new show coming out on Fox called Rail. It's being produced by Gerard Carmichael. So all these people were at the top of the field. And it was just very exciting to see them all in one place at one time. I got amazing interviews with them. And I go up for like the last three or four days. So it's constant shows from morning to night. And I think every one of them would be considered Foxy because mm -hmm. they're all doing something special. And they all work very hard to get there. Nobody gives you anything in the comedy world. You have to really work your butt off to get known because there's so much competition. In New York these days, we got a lot of clubs. There are, there are actually more places to perform in New York than Los Angeles. So a lot of the comics from Los Angeles come to New York to perform. And I get to see them all. Tonight I'll be going to uh, the Gotham Comedy Club. They have the, the world's first virtual reality comedy show. Started about a month ago. And the owner, Chris Mazzilli, is very into bringing in new things. And he was approached by a virtual reality company. And they had had a show there called Gotham Comedy Live. And it was a very big success. As a matter of fact, Mark Cuban and Ryan Seacrest produced the show for their network, Access TV. And so that show ended, and now they were approached by virtual reality. So it's a variety show, a bunch of different comedians every week. But people all around the world can put on headphones and watch the show and feel like they're sitting in the club watching the, watching the comedy show. Huh. That's, really that's fascinating. Yeah, and that's where I'm going tonight. Every, just about every night, I'm out covering the comedy scene. Uh, there's a huge comedy website called the Interabang, which is a really weird name. Have you ever heard that word, the Interabang? No. <laughs> it's a real thing. It's a real thing. It's a part of punctuation. It's a question mark followed by an exclamation point. Aha, uh -huh. oh, okay. That's called the Interabang. I have no idea why they called it that, but they do. And I write the main column in the Interabang. It comes out every Monday. And I cover the comedy scene. I write about what's happening in New York and who came in from L.A. and who's got a new TV show. And it's filled with pictures and fun stuff. And so I'm out every night covering the scene. Uh, and that was something I was going to ask you, Jeffrey, is for our listeners, if they want to get more information about your book and actually your books, because you've written multiple books, and uh, what you're doing with uh, Comedy Matters TV, how do they get in touch with you? How can they find more information about you and your work? 
there's a couple of ways. First, my website, which is comedymatterstv.com. They can also look up my name if you Google me. I'm all over the internet. Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. The R comes first, because a lot of people are misspelling Jeffrey these days. I don't know why. And my last name, Gurian, is spelled G-U-R-I-A-N, as in Nancy. So if they go to jeffreygurian.com or comedymatterstv.com, they'll see more than they ever wanted to know about me. There's, there's all kinds of stuff up there. Comedy, the, and there's a whole section under the About column on spirituality and healing, because I'm very involved in alternative medicine. I do healing work to take away pain with my hands. Um, and there's a, there's a whole thing on headache therapy and my stuttering technique. It's all there. If they want to see the videos, um, that's on YouTube. And you would go to youtube.com slash Gurian News Network. And I'm coming up on 2 million views. Um, all the interviews that I told you about, plus over 500 more. And on Twitter and Instagram, I'm at Jeffrey Gurian. And uh, I'll even give my email if anybody wants to write to me for information. It's jeffrey at jeffreygurian.com. I have no problem giving out my email. Uh, jeffrey at jeffreygurian.com. And I welcome people with questions if they have any questions. And also if they know anybody who stutters to carry that message because there's not that many people saying that you can be helped. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people actually get annoyed if you say that you can help because people think that, that you can't be cured from stuttering. And I'm uh, an example that you can be, you know? And, and I think it's important for people to know that. Probably, maybe not everybody can be helped, but if you read what I have on my website, that's what I write. If you read what I have and it makes sense to you, if you stutter or if you know somebody who stutters, then you might be able to be helped by the technique that I use. And so I would welcome that if people would look at my site and see all the information is up there and a lot of new stuff too. I just recently shot an episode of Crashing, you know, that, that comedy on, uh, on HBO uh, starring Pete Holmes and Judd, a Judd Apatow is the director. You know, Judd is like the king of Hollywood these days. And so he asked me to be in the episode and we just filmed it about a week or so ago in New York City. And if you know Nick Kroll and John Mulaney, they had a show, Nick had a show called Kroll Show on Comedy Central. I hold the honor of being the very first person to ever be pranked with too much tuna. Are you familiar <laughs> with too much tuna? I did see that clip, yes indeed. I'll, uh, I'll include a link to that clip in the show notes as well as uh, links to your book as well so listeners can find that. Thank you. Yeah, it went viral. It's a silly thing about giving people a huge tuna sandwich, and it's got about 750,000 views already on Comedy Central. People seem to like it. And they did a show on Broadway called Oh Hello this past year. It ran for about four months. They only wanted it to run about four months. It, it could still be running because it was so popular. And they had me open the show for them, which was an amazing thing. I can't believe it. I was on the red carpet on Broadway in New York City, thanks to Nick Kroll and John Mulaney. So it's been very interesting. I get a chance to do a lot of fun stuff. You things, bet. Things that I would never expect, even being on the Terry Fox podcast. Whoever <laughs> thought? <laughs> Certainly not me. <laughs> not me either. That's what's interesting about life. You never know what's going to happen. Amen to that. Well, we are bumping up on time here, Jeffrey. So if you would enlighten us with just one example of how to create your own happiness center. And I know that's something that you teach in your book. Um, and because I think this happiness center, creating that happiness center would probably relate to how to be and stay foxy. So would you enlighten us with just that one little nugget? Absolutely. And it's a great question. I'm so glad that you chose that from everything else. Once you leave the house, you have no control over what happens to you during the day. You're at the mercy of whatever the universe has in store for you. The only place you can hope to control your environment is where you live, in your home. And it doesn't matter if you have one small room or a huge house. I believe that you have to surround yourself with things that make you smile. 
in my case, the color white makes me happy. I need a lot of light. My, my carpeting is white, my piano is white, my furniture is white, my car is white. And then I, I mix in very bright colors. You should surround yourself with pictures of people that you love, pictures of people in your family, little children. Every place you look should be something that makes you smile. My home is filled with balloons. I have crayons everywhere. I have little toys that I collect all over. And that may sound childish to some people, but it's very important to stay connected to your inner child. I don't care how old you are, each inside each one of us still remains that little child that you used to be. And the way it used to be fun when your friends would come and say, hey, could you come out to play? That's not supposed to end just because you grow up and do something serious. So you should create your own happiness center so that wherever you look where you live, like I have affirmations around all over, positive statements, wherever you look, you see something positive in my home. And people come over here and they're amazed. They go, I don't want to leave. It just feels so good to be here because people resonate with that. You know, there are many ways. Wake up to quiet music. Don't wake up to the news. The news is too upsetting. Wake up 10 or 15 minutes before you have to and just lay there and appreciate the day and ask for guidance. Those kind of things help you to create a happiness center. And that's how you become foxy. Amen to that. Well, Jeffrey, thank you so much for being a positive influence in this world and making people laugh and making people smile and bringing that to us today. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I always say it takes one to know one, Terry. So if you see it, it's because you're the same way. Thank you very much for having me on.